welcome to part two of the CBA level one curriculum's final project, the gate latch. And today we're going to focus on the hook. Here's the actual latch. Um, so let's have a look at the hook end of that. You've got a fairly major weld. You've got the weld finishes below the shaft. That's important. It's slightly forward leaning and it's one inch ID. The shaft has a specific measurement, I believe, of three inches, and the eye has an ID of seven eighths of an inch. So let's have a look at the hook end first. Let's have a look at the actual hook end itself. You've got a fairly major weld, and you've got the uh, one inch ID bend. The bend is actually forward leaning, that helps with the security, keeps the latch, if you will, in the keep. And then the major weld here, the footprint of the top of that weld is such that once it's in the gate, you can see that it goes past halfway on the keep and stops that gate from being sprung open if a bit of livestock leans against the gate or something. When we look at this weld, it's a nick and fold. So you've basically got two bits of round bar stacked one on top of each other. The problem is, the material used to fill the sides has got to come from one or both of those bars, which means the actual weld is going to get diminished quite a lot. What happens if we put some fill material in there before we weld? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to devise a little technique where we've got fill material in the weld ready to go, so we don't lose as much of the material and get a much blockier weld, which is what we need for the keep. Looking at the bar specifically, you've got a fairly major weld. I believe that's inch and a quarter target measurement uh, from the drawing. This is going to be about three eighths of an inch on the seat there, and it comes down to a fairly blunt taper on the end. Mine is full width, three eighths of an inch all the way through. And I've used a wedge of material to create the filler material. And that's what we're gonna look at now. You're going to want to use a hot cut chisel, which if you're following along with the level one curriculum you've already made, it would be very difficult to do this barb um, with a, um, a hardy cut off. So I recommend using the hot cut chisel. If you've made your flux spoon as part of the welding projects for the level one curriculum, then you'll know that the, uh, the starting sequence for this will be familiar to you. Using the end of a piece of 3 8 round, working at the offside edge of the anvil, I want you to draw a very short, blunt taper. When I say short, I mean not long. Just do the blunt taper, then I want you to turn it 90 degrees, drop it down a little bit, and then we're going to create the wedge. And the wedge should be about 5 eighths, no longer than 3 quarters of an inch. The next move is important. We're going to hold that wedge or the bar parallel to the edge of the anvil. But I want you to hold it at a 45 degree angle to the edge of the anvil. And we are going to drive that wedge over this round edge. And we're going to divide that wedge material into two sections. And that's going to create the filler material for between our two round bars. Here's the results of thus far. We made the wedge, we made the cleft, and now we need to nick and fold this. So taking your hot cut chisel, and we're gonna position it right at the top of that cleft, not on the parent stock. We don't need a little gap. Right at the top and in the cleft, and I want to cut about halfway through, and then we're going to fold the material away. Once you've made your nick fold weld, I want you to pull that wedge in over a radius edge of the anvil. I want you to put your chisel right above the tip of that wedge, not back a little bit, but right at that tip. 
and I want you to lean that slightly forwards as you do the same thing. Cut about halfway through and then we will fold it on itself. Now because you've angled the chisel, this will want to drag the material with it uh, and that's what we want to have happen. So let that, uh, let that go. I'm going to take another heat, otherwise it runs the risk of tearing, not folding. And then at this stage, I want you to tidy everything up. And notice I'm swinging this on its axis. And you should be left with a block of material, something like that. And you can see we've got fill material on either side of our two round bars to help with our weld. The other thing is that because we've just backed it up, this is reasonably straight and this we can work out later because it's going to be a taper anyway. When we weld, I want to come in with flat or maybe slightly angled blows. Don't go too heavy with the angle or the back of the bar here is going to bend for you. We will just make our weld and then we'll dress the sides and if you're like me you've got a slight crown to your hammer so when you dress those sides in order to close the seam right at the back you're going to have to drop your hammer handle just a little bit and force that bit uh, into the back of the weld there. So let's have a go and see what we get. That's the start of our weld, so we'll brush that up, take another heat, and do a little more. Just to recap a little on the weld, we're going to heat it up to a nearly a welding temperature, which is a bright orange. Brush it if you wish. Then we're going to flux it. Flux the seam at the front there, flux the sides, and then back in. I believe there is a degradation of the flux in the hot environment or the hot oxygenated environment of the forge. So I want to bring that piece up to a welding temperature before I flux. And now I'm looking for the flux to start to boil on the actual piece. You'll see little pin pricks about the size of a, a pin head uh, of little bubbles as the flux starts to boil. Let's go back to the anvil. I'm just tidying up the back of that weld a little bit. Brush that and take a look. And there we are thus far. Remember, it must look wet to weld. It's either going to look wet with uh, liquid steel or it's going to look wet with flux. But if it looks dry and crusty, it's not going to weld. So at this stage, I just backed it up. I tried to crisp up uh, a little bit of the top of the barb there. And I'm getting ready to start to put in my uh, taper. So I'm not so worried about that weld at the tip because I can do that as I'm forging in my taper. And I'm going to come in with the cross pin to create the taper. I find that if I try and do it with my hammer, I end up bending the parent bar.
While the end of the barb is still reasonably blunt, I'm going to try and dress the top of the barb with a sharp edge of the anvil. And then continue my work drawing the taper. Here's my finished barb, which is roughly an inch and a quarter. And I've got at least three eighths of an inch there. I've got a nice flat spot there just as an aesthetic. And it comes down to a blunt taper. Let's call that eighth of an inch on the end. So now that we have the weld complete, let's focus on turning the rest of this hook end. We need to do a little math first to work out how much material we need. Let's have a look at this. So the first thing the drawing calls for is the actual top of the barb is about three eighths of an inch below the shaft of the hook. Then you've got the shaft of the hook material, three eighths. So you're going to have, in essence, three quarters of an inch of material there that's straight. Then you're going to have the half circle, one inch, and we work that out with the other staple, the tapered staple. And then you're going to have a little bit of a bend here, a curve, um, that is going to be neither the eye here or the hook nor the shaft and I typically I allow the thickness of the material, so about three-eighths of an inch for that. So let's do the math and see what we get. We said we need three-quarters of an inch of straight material. This, I believe, we said yesterday was two and a sixteenth or two. Let's call it two and a sixteenth for the moment. That gets us to here, and then we're going to add, I'm going to say, three-sixteenth. So the thickness of the material is 3 8 so I'm aiming for a point that's right in the middle of that bend, which is the 3 16 one side, 3 16 the other side. Total there is going to give us th uh, 2 and a quarter, 3 inches total. From the top of here to the midpoint in the bend right there. What I do know is when I take a bar, if I put a mark on here and I'm going to start working this bend over the offside edge, there will be some anvil creep and I need to know what that is. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a test piece. So I'm going to come back about three inches or so, make a mark, and then I'm going to put hopefully a very deep center punch mark there, deep because I want you to be able to see it as I'm working. That should be deep enough. And I'm going to hold that right at the point of curvature, so not in the middle there, right at the where this anvil starts to curve. We'll look at it before we bend, and then we'll look at it after. As we're starting to make this bend, I'm going to use a small ball-peen hammer, and my ball is a true ball. It's not one of the conical-shaped ones. That can lead to a bit of frustration. And I am going to come here drop that down about the thickness of the material out and I'm hoping to be able to initiate the bend for the hook and that that little bit remains straight because of inertia or straightish anyway. Let's see what happens. So I'm hoping you can see that my center punch now is midpoint along the bend, which means it was pulled out as I was working, which is the creep at the edge of the anvil. And so as I worked, it was pulled along. We need to factor in how much creep when we do our bend for the hook. Now, if you've got a different edge to me, or if you've got no edge and you're working over the bick, you may have to do your own test pieces and find out what you need to allow. And there we are, we have our three quarters of an inch below grade. I could have tightened that up a little bit, which I may just do. There we go. 
go. So I've made some chalk marks on my bar. I came back, I think it was uh, three and three eighths, and three and three quarters, and then four and an eighth, was it? For a total of 11 and a quarter. And I'm going to cut this off now with a saw so I get a nice square end. I'm going to focus on making the eye first because that's something I can put into the jaws of my tongs, my bolt jaw tongs, as I turn the rest of the hook. Not so the other way around. All my bends are going to be with the barb up. made initial start now I'm going to finish the end something that would be hard to get to later I'm just taking those corners on you see I'm rocking the bar backwards and forwards because as I work this around it creates a flat spot so I've got the start and the finish of my eye and now I just need to bend the middle let's give that a go I'm going to work over an area of the bick that I consider to be about seven eighths or so Let's just pop that in there now we just need to tidy that up this is a nice move I've just quenched as much of the eye as I can and now I'm just going to try and tuck that end in here's our eye and I feel like I'm at one inch there not just a bit shy of one inch, not seven eighths, so I could afford to subtract a little out of my measurements when I do it for real. Now the allowance was three inches for the straight shaft. My anvil is about four and a quarter, so I'm not going to be able to make this bend over the edge of the anvil without the eye interfering. So I'm going to have to work over the horn to start or initiate that bend. Same rules of pie bring that mark back just a little bit and I'm working over a very sharp radius there and now I'm just going to come back over my one inch just tighten it up a bit I'm just going to tidy this up a little bit I feel like a bend could be a little stronger that up just a touch Simmer down here's our finished hook about one inch ID there we've got about three inches of straight stock that's not too bad the eyes a little big but I can live with that and it's all straight so we're going to move on to the tenon staple 